to explain the problem of evil, to explain the problem of sin, or at least to consider it. For the problem of sin and the problem of evil have not been fully explained throughout life. Life is still full of unanswered questions. Why do the just meet with misfortune? Why do evil fall upon the righteous and the good? Why do little children die before they have tasted life really. These along with many other questions are perplexing and have been perplexing throughout time. And it will take only God to give us the satisfactory ultimate answer. Welcome to Emerge Podcast 360. I'm your host, Maserati. We want to thank you for tuning in no matter where you are. That was the great Reverend C.L. Franklin, the father of the great Aretha Franklin. We want to thank you for tuning in. We have a very special show for you. We have a new segment called Community Garden, where our first guest would be Minister Terry Newsom Sr. as we'll discuss the state of the black community in the church and his thoughts on prevention of suicide since the death of his son, Sergeant Terry Newsom Jr., we just has been brought to you by Involved Social and Civic Club, where we understand the social and civic needs of love, learn, live, and laugh. Thank you to Brazil Family Insurance Agency. And this episode is being brought to you by Stepping Stones LLC Counseling of Jonesboro, Louisiana. We have Mr. Terry Newsom in the building. He's the father of four. He's retired from Atmos Energy in 2004, where he accepted his ministry in 2004. Mr. Newsom is a pillar in the community. He's now the associate pastor for Greater Magnolia Baptist Church. He's been involved in his kids' life and the community with athletes, athletics, sponsoring programs, and he was quite an athlete back in the day itself. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Minister Terry Newsom. Senior. God bless you. God bless you, Brother Odom. Uh, it's a privilege and an honor to be here with you. Uh, I'm so glad that you invited me here, and uh, I couldn't say no to you. Uh, and I believe that uh, we probably can learn something from each other. Yeah, so uh, just go right ahead and, 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 and come with your questions or your comments to me, and, and I'll try to reciprocate that back to you. Well, Mr. Newsom, uh, first of all, uh, tell me how was it for you growing up uh, 
here in Scrap City? Uh, man, Bath Strip is a special place, a special place in my heart. Uh, growing up, uh, it was it, it was great. I had a I had a really wonderful childhood. Uh, thinking about uh, how things are today, and you look at neighborhoods where neighbors don't even know neighbors. Where in my neighborhood, everybody knew everybody. Uh, everybody got a chance to tag you on your rear end too if you if you stepped out of line. But uh, nowadays, you can't say anything to other people's kids, and and like I say, you don't even really know who they are. I look at a lot of athletes, and athletes, uh, first thing they do when they when they make it, quote unquote, uh, they tell the story of how they didn't have, how uh, mom worked three, four jobs, and daddy wasn't there, and and all these things. And I'm not going to say that any of them are falsely saying what they're saying, but uh, when I look back at my life, my childhood, we really didn't have much either. But uh, somehow, some way, God blessed my mother and father to, to make a way for us. Uh, speaking of my mother and father, you know, they were, they were good people. You know, uh, they loved us. Uh, it was 11 of us. And at one time, I think about at least 10 was in the same house at the same time with mom and dad. But somehow they made it. They, uh, they took care of us. They provided for us. And upon the passing of my mom and dad, I wrote a little snippet in a in a in, a, in the program. I, I said, "Well, my mom and dad wasn't perfect, but they were perfect for me." And uh, I couldn't have had better parents. Uh, like I say, looking back at at the money mom made, it it really didn't amount to much. Daddy didn't make much, but uh, but they took care of us. They provided for us. Uh, we wasn't abused. Uh, the kids in the neighborhood, it was a, it was a awesome neighborhood because there were so many brothers in the neighborhood. If I was 10, there was kids around the neighborhood that were 10. My brother, he was 12. There was other kids around the neighborhood that was 12. I've never seen a neighborhood like it. But uh, we, we had enough always to be able to play ball, go outside and play ball, or basketball, baseball, football, whatever it was. Uh, and then when Christmas time come around, you know, we all had something. You know, and we were proud to have and get whatever they were, whatever it was that we got. So we were blessed, uh, and I tried to teach that value to my kids. You know, it ain't about uh, presence; it's about presence, and 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 that's what we try to you know live by. You know, being there for one another. So uh, wonderful, wonderful growing up. Uh, I, I I wouldn't trade it. I wouldn't trade it. Now looking back, um, when you grew up to now. We see the violence, and I like to say all these diseases that are starting to plague our community uh, from the violence, from the drugs, and now this virus we call suicide has now struck Bastrop in particular in a raging way. And the thing is, Do you think the lack of this generation having fundamentals from the church and having a church that they can really go to to vent about these problems that we see occur? Well, let me say, if it's okay for me to say, uh, suicide, from my standpoint of growing up, it always seemed to involve white people. Uh, mostly older white men. And then it started to trickle down and started seeing it happening to maybe one here, one there. But all of a sudden, it's like a raging fire. It's like they've decided that that's the way out. Uh, there's no other way. And, 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 and when it happens, it makes you start to question yourself and wonder... You know, what did I miss? Where did I go wrong? But I believe that Satan has his hands on our children. Uh, That's just not common for black people. But it's becoming common. And, and, And it's becoming way too common. The church, when it comes to that, uh, I had a cousin that preached. He's 
dead and gone now in California, but I heard him say one time that preachers are preaching, but they're not reaching. And I think we're forgetting about uh, those younger people that are in there. We preach to all the older people, the ones that will shout, the ones that will say amen, but we don't say anything to those that are sitting there trying to make an understanding of what you're talking about. And we got to reach back and start talking to them as well. Now, God can prepare you to do that. He can give you a message that will resonate to older and younger people if you let him. But many times we don't let God give us messages. We just go and find us one somewhere and say, that one sounds good. I'll preach that. But we need to go back to letting God do that. The older preachers that we used to have, uh, as you know for yourself, they are dead and gone now. Uh, they are leaving. And and now it's another generation of preachers, and, and, and we're getting older. Uh, but there's a lot of wisdom that's gone. Uh, libraries, I would call them, are gone. But here we are. We're the ones that's carrying the torch right now. And and I, I, I don't believe that God is really pleased with us the way we're carrying it. That's just my take on it. Um, we need to be more involved in our kids life children are watching children are listening they may not see it but they're watching and they're listening and what they're seeing ain't much and what they're hearing ain't much and so what we need to do is go back stop where you're at and go back and fix it i coached uh my grandson t-ball this year uh, I thought I was through coaching, you know. I, I, I when it came to Terrence and Boogie and all them, and CC, I, I didn't take my kids to practice and drop them off. I stayed there and practiced them, and I spent as much time with other kids on the on the field than I did with my own. I could work with mine at home if I need some personal one on one, but I worked with them as a team. And right now today, I have kids that are grown men. When they see me, they still call me coach. That's having an influence on them. And maybe you don't know how to play baseball. Maybe you can't coach baseball, but you can support them by being at the game. You know, we preachers now, so we ain't got time. You know, we, we don't have time to go to the park. I got I to gotta go teach Bible class. I got to go visit this person. I got to go do this. It's always something that the church get to blame for us not having time. But the church is the very reason why we should have time. And so uh, when I say that, you know, we don't, we don't, uh, you may not be able to do this and that when it comes to coaching, but there's other ways you can support. And believe me, you, when you give a child some attention and you show a child respect, I'm not talking about kissing it behind. I'm talking about show him respect. The child will respect you back. And that's when like one day in Dawson Park, I'm out there, and, and I see a little kid that I had coached before. He's out there. I heard bottles busting, and I looked over, and he, and, and he was just about to throw one. And he looked at me, and he just dropped it as coach. I didn't have to say anything. I didn't look mean or nothing. I just happened to look over at him, and he dropped it. That's respect that he gave back to me because I gave him some. And so that's what we have to do. We can't, we can't get so big until – you know, people look at us and we think we're bigger than life itself. No, I'm just a servant. And that's the way we all should be, is servants for the Lord, not just uh, all about what we can get. Not all about being popular. Uh, we, when we go to these council meetings and, and, and these people running for office, they come to church. They, 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 the only time you see them is when they come to church. And they're looking for your vote. And then when you support them and you encourage your congregation, your parishioners to support them, and you put them in office, you put them in there expecting them to do something. Oftentimes, we make the big mistake of wanting to be friends with the governor, want to be friends with the senators. We want to be friends with Congress, congressmen and, and mayors and all that. We're not supposed to be friends with them, but we're supposed to have a relationship with them to where we can sit down at a table and get something done together. Uh, many times they get in the office and, and that's just what they, they, they get in there and they sit down. And, and you don't hear from them no more until it's time to run for election again. 
But we need to stop that. We need to stop trying to get on their side and be their friend. We need to just go to them and tell them what we need. This is what it's going to take for us to help our kids. And we don't want to hear, uh, let me get back at you. I want to hear, okay, I got you. And if you tell me that, then we can get somewhere. But we just can't keep kicking the can down the road. We can't keep passing it on, hoping somebody else will fix it. Now, on the other hand, uh, you know, you start talking about increasing police, uh, increasing this and that. People have a part to play also. Uh, people got to want to stop doing what they're doing. You can police all you want, but that don't mean that I'm going to be able to stop that person from walking out of this house and going down the road shooting somebody because you never know who's going to do what. But we can be more in the public's eye with a positive attitude, showing respect, and then you'll start seeing it reciprocate back. Mr. Newsom, we're going to take a mission. When we come back, I want you to continue uh, through your eyes, looking through a glass. What have and what has happened, you think, to the beautiful Scrap City? We'll be right back with Minister Terry Newsom Sr. after this intermission. Was Satan himself. And thank God that even though Satan may be among the just, his presence never go unobserved by God. But there's another thing about this. It seems that there is no society of people where Satan is completely absent. We like to say that Satan go to the choir rehearsal sometimes. Satan meet with the deacons and trustees sometimes. Satan meet in the usher board meetings. Satan, uh, Satan meet in all of the gatherings, even of the righteous and of the godly. But God always observes his presence. Hence the question. Welcome back. Welcome back to Emerge 360. We're still here with Minister Terry Newsom Sr. And we're looking at Scrap City through the eyes and the glass of Minister Newsom. Minister Newsom, you were speaking about being more involved with the youngsters as we see them slowly uh, demise and turn into something that we may not be able to control if we don't latch on to it now and try to fix it. Uh, share with the people some of the solutions and some of the innovation ideas uh, the Most High has revealed to you about that situation. I'll tell you, uh, one thing I've, I've, I've seen since I was a little boy up until now is jobs are not here in Bastrop anymore. Uh, at one time, there was an old mill and a new mill. Uh, then it was just a new mill, and they did a lot of hiring. Uh, then that mill shut down, and other things started shutting down and leaving Bastrop. And I don't know whose fault it is, but surely you need to replace something with something. If something leaves, there should be something else to come in and take its place. And and young people, are, uh, I think when I was in high school, we would get out of high school, and there was... Uh, you know, that opportunity, either you go to college or you would hope that you can get on at the paper mill because it paid pretty good money. They don't have that option anymore. Uh, even just labor jobs. I, I worked on a garbage truck for about four years uh, here in Bastrop. Uh, and when I did, there was a driver and there was two of us on the back of that truck. That's three jobs right there. Now you'll see a truck coming by with one man driving, and he got these lifts on there that's dumping it. So two jobs gone right there. You can't even find just a labor job on a garbage truck. So jobs are leaving. Technology is taking over. And kids are pretty smart and savvy when it comes to technology, but they don't put it to good use. I put my daughter, Cece, I think she was about 12 years old, I put her on a, a, a miniature backhoe. I had rented one to do some digging in my yard. And I put her up there just so, she, so that she could get the feel of it. And she was actually operating the thing about as good as I was. Uh, and I think it came from, it come from, you know, you sit around and you play those games all day. You, you learn your right hand, left hand, eye coordination. 
And all of a sudden you can do this just as good as I can. And it took me some a while to learn how to do this. So jobs are not there. Technology is taking over. And we need to get with the program. Those that are in authority, those that are in government, need to bring something here to teach our kids. I keep hearing them talking about it in other places, how they're going to bring this school and that school with the technology. We need something like that here. I was a young man working at the hospital, and I wasn't doing much uh, janitor. And an uh, older man, old man, he asked me one day, he said, son, do you have a job? And I told him, I said, yes, sir, you know, because black folks, young black kids don't work, you know. So I, I was proud to tell him, yes, sir, I got a job. He said, that's good. He said, but you need to learn a trade. And it puzzled me for a minute. Said, what did he mean that I need to learn a trade? He said, you need to learn a trade, something that is always needed. Uh, find you something that you like to do that people will always have to call on you for. And my daddy was a carpenter. My brother-in-law was a carpenter. And I began working with them and learning from them. And, and thank God I have a trade. And that's what young people want to do. They don't want to go to school, unfortunately. But people have been dropping out of school for years. But now they telling their parents, I ain't going to school no more. They tell their parents, I'm not going to church. And the parents are just letting them do what they want to do. You got to bend a sapling while it's young. You've heard that saying. If they're in your house, they need to do what you say do. And you can't wait till they're 14, 15, 16 years old to start telling them. You need to do it while they're young, put it instilled in them. And if you're not going to go to school, you need to learn a trade. Because there's something out there that's always going to be needed. Carpentry, plumbing, electrician, roofing, all these type things are out there. And another thing is we have to be careful today what we tell our children. We, we've been telling our children for years, you can be anything you want to be. And when you think about that, children today will paraphrase you. They'll take what you said and then they'll say, so what you're saying is, and they take it from there. I can be anything I want to be. So I can be like Jim Bob over there. He's selling dope, and he ride a nice car with the rims on it and the music. And you said I could be anything I want to be. Be specific. Be clear to them. Let them know they can be whatever they want to be as long as it's something positive. Do something constructive with your life, not destructive with your life. And, and things will be a whole lot better. But we all have a part to play. The church has a part to play in that. Parents have a part to play in that. And everyone else in the community has a part to play in our children because the song used to say, I believe our children are the future. Well, right now it's not looking so bright. We got to turn that around. We can't, we got to stop acting like we don't care. It's not bothering me, so I'm not going to bother it. Politicians, church leaders, we all have to learn to shake things up sometimes. We can't just sit back and be comfortable all the time. We got to learn to shake things up. People might not like you, but that's good. You might not be popular. That's fine, too. But at least you got something positive done. And when you leave this world, then you'll leave a mark on it that you did do something. When God asked you, what did you do for me? You're going to sit there and you're going to think and ponder and wonder, and you should be able to answer him right away. The Bible says, feed the hungry, visit the sick. All these things. Did you do any of these things? He gave us commandments, not suggestions. And so that's what we got to learn. Our kids are in a maze right now, walking around in a maze. Don't know how to get out. But it's up to us to help them get out and let them know that they can be amazing instead of walking around in a maze. Well, uh, to piggyback on what you're saying about the community involvement, I don't know how true it is, but I'm going to speak on it about Miss Jackson giving, Katrina Jackson giving certain churches a certain amount of money uh, for programs for the kids this summer. And it, it is programs going on and going around. But it almost seems as we, as churches, we in competition with who can do the most and who gets the most recognition. And when I feel like Dotson Park door should be open until 8 o'clock. Every church that has a gym should be open until 8 o'clock. 
everybody that has some type of facility for these kids to come into should be open from 8 to 8 because you never know what can happen before a few hours we know where they're at. What, what, what do you get from that, Mr. Newsom? I agree with you. Uh, I would like to say that uh, Dawson Paul may have played a part in saving my life, uh, having the doors open, being able to go there. Uh, they had basketball out there. You can go out there and shoot pool. It was cool, you know, in certain places in there in, in the summertime and warm in the wintertime. Uh, go upstairs and you can do some boxing, and I just love that. Uh, so it's so many things that the, that the community can offer, but we got to stop competing with one another. We got to stop competing who has the most members? Who 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 preach better than who? Who we got to start coming together, and don't worry about who gets the credit. They say Michael Jordan is the greatest of all time. He's the goat, and I don't quit. I don't. I don't deny it. At the same token, I'm a Scottie Pippen type person myself. You see what I'm saying? Mike couldn't win those championships by himself. I, uh, he was good. And I might be controversial to somebody, but it took the whole team. Unless you are a boxer, you play golf or tennis, those are individual sports. If you win, you win. If you lose, you did it. But when it comes to team sports, it takes all of you. And that's where we're at. We're in a team thing here. This is not about individuals. And somebody uh, didn't get the memo, I believe, because, you know, it's, it, it, in so many places and people, you'll see the individualism in it. And that's not what we should be. Uh, when I think about the help that we get, there are grants out there. There are people that know how to get them. There are people in the church that know how to get grants. There are people in the church that know how to start up housing and all this. They know how to do these things, but they're sitting on their hands. In 1969, J. Edgar Hoover was over the FBI, and he thought that the Black Panther Party was a threat to the government. He thought it was a threat to society, wanted to shut them down. At that time, my research tells me that uh, Black Panther is only about 300 paid members, paying members. But what they did was they fed hungry black children, they helped them get clothes, they protected them, made sure they got schooling, these type things. This is what the Black Panther was doing, even though they had a bad rep. The church has to do more than what the Black Panther Party did or is doing. The church has to step up and do more than what we are doing. The church is silent. And let me tell you something. There's a study that says from the ages of 16 to 34, Black children are not in church. Ages 16, 34. They say that they only have two different age groups. That's infants and seniors. Infants and seniors. There's a whole generation missing out of the church. And one of the reasons is is because young people don't feel like the church is relevant anymore. And it's strange that you said those statistics about you know, 16, age 34, and I was doing some research, uh, being a mental health counselor myself, I never had to deal with it from my people, as you said earlier, but as I did the research, that is the age range, especially those younger uh, ages from 12 to 21, dealing with the peer pressures and the things that's going on in society, the climate change. And then when COVID came along and people started isolating, the numbers rocketed. And we're going to take an intermission, and when we come back, I want to talk about Boogie and him being isolated, being in the military, and then COVID hitting, and then the tragic way some will say he left. When we come back, we're going to speak about that and your insight, how you became a pioneer for the uh, prevention of suicide after this intermission. The Lord gave me. It wouldn't be wonderful if everybody thought about their troubles like that or thought about what they had lost yeah. from this standpoint. Some people lose what they have. Some people run into extreme of bad luck and crack up. Yeah. 
Some even commit suicide. Some quit the church. Some take all kinds of radical positions. But Job's position is the only position to take. He said the Lord gave. And the Lord has taken away. I'm not going to curse. I'm not going to denounce God. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I wish I had somebody here to pray with me. And uh, when Job did not crumble under either the physical attack or the economic attack, then uh, Satan decided to attack him from the standpoint of the love for his children. Welcome back. Welcome back to Emerge Podcast 360. It's Community Garden with Minister Terry Newsom Sr. Uh, people, I want you to listen, pay close attention to this second part of, the, of this show. As we hear the story about Sergeant Terry Newsom Jr. From his father, who I think is an admirable man. If you haven't heard the eulogy, he did it. And that's why you hear the clippings in the story by Job today from Reverend C.L. Franklin. Because when I sat back and I reviewed the story about Junior and I started observing Mr. Newsom, I said, my God, Job is being tested. Mr. Newsom, uh, give us some insight since you have become a pioneer on the prevention or suicide. Tell us a little bit about boogieing leading up to that day. Uh, well, let me let me start by saying, uh, God would give me a message to preach uh, before I even know that I have an assignment to preach. A lot of folks take engagements; I call them assignments. And before Boogie died. Uh, I usually take, you know, while I'm taking a shower, uh, I can be in the shower or something or watching television and then a message will come, you know, just, mm, you know, and now let me go get this scripture. Let me go find, let me see what this talking about related to what he put on my heart. And while I was showering, there was a message that came across me to say, uh, it's not over at the grave. Uh, oftentimes, or many of the times, I, I never know where, why I'm going to be preaching or who I'm going to be preaching for or words of comfort. I never know who I'm going to give them for. But all of a sudden, I get a phone call a day or two later saying, would you do words of comfort? In? Like, okay. So I had no idea that this message, when I got it, was for my baby. And uh, so when he did what he did, I asked my pastor actually first to do the eulogy, and he told me he would. But my son and my nephew Troy, uh, a good friend of mine, they all told me, say, now, you know Boogie would want you to do it. You know, I'm like, yeah, he thought I could do anything. He, he, he just thought the world of me. And so that's how I come across me actually doing the eulogy and, and from that text and from Job because of uh, God had given it to me before it even happened. But leading up to that uh, and what I have discovered, people need to pay close attention to their children. If, if, if a child tells you there's a monster on his bed, don't tell him just go back to bed. Go and look. And that, that bothers me when people shun children off when they're complaining about something. Booger told me that uh, he wasn't sleeping. Um. Uh, I started realizing he was giving things away. Uh, there were different things. He, w- he wouldn't go anywhere. He would come home. If he was in Texas or living in Alexandria, he would come home and didn't really want to go. I'm like, man, why don't you go hang out with your boys? Man, I don't feel like going nowhere, Dad. He was withdrawing himself from people. These are all signs. I didn't know it then, but I know it now. And... And so when I put all that together now, it, I'm like, man, I should have, I should have, I should have. But I didn't know any better. So it's, it's a parent's worst nightmare 
to get that phone call. And uh, the thing of it was, was me and my wife driving home from West Monroe had been out to eat. And it was about 12 o'clock. And on our way in, I mean, where we were in, in West Monroe, you had to hit the bypass coming home. And I said that if that girl had caught his girlfriend at the time, and I, I, I'm not blaming her that she didn't know no better to call, but I just felt like you should have. I'm his parent. And, 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 and put a pin there. First of all, when somebody tells you they're having thoughts of that, tell somebody. Tell the parent. Tell somebody. Don't just keep it thinking, nah, I don't want to mess up my friendship with you or whatever. Uh, I've heard that somebody, uh, he had talked to a couple of his friends about it. Why didn't y'all tell us? If his girlfriend had called, we could have shot from Monroe and went right on down to Elizabeth, just an hour away, and, may, and perhaps prevented it. I don't know. But at the same token, uh, pay attention. Uh, if, if, if someone is, is, is talking about committing suicide, by all means, tell somebody. Don't just keep it to yourself thinking, y'all, you don't want to mess up your friendship because if they did, you ain't got them no more anyway. So, but anyway, he, he had started withdrawing, started giving away things, and uh, he was just fed up. A happy kid. He loved to rap. I can show you videos of him on stage rapping. He opened for somebody named Lil Boosie, and, and, and I mean, he was, he was doing good. And when you see him, he looks so happy. He's up there and he's jumping around and he's flapping around and going on and he's rapping and he, he, he got this big old smile on his face. And you couldn't tell me that a person like that was going to do what he did. But it happened. And, and we got to live with that. Uh, it's, been, it's been tough. Uh, I don't know if you want to get into that part yet or not. But uh, it, it, it has been tough on, on, on us, uh, a lot of his friends. Uh, my baby girl, but uh, take your time. Uh, the, uh, being being tough is to say the least. Uh, you know, we understand this thing about you know the older person leaving first. You know, we think that's the cycle of life. We don't expect for the younger people to go before the older people. When mom left, you know, that was that hurt. You know, anytime you lose mom, that, that hurts. Dad, it hurts. But to lose a child is something different. And I'll tell you one example. A good friend of mine, Gary Eve, I, you may know Gary. Uh, Gary, me and Gary played baseball together. Uh, he was pitching, I was back catching. And, and, and we, we were good friends. But... When this happened to me, Gary called me. Gary had made it to major leagues. He didn't have to call me. You know, he could have been way up there. Well, he ain't, he can't look back on, on me. But he had made major league pitching for the Atlanta Braves, Seattle Mariners. But he called me, and he prayed for me. And he told me he's going to continue to pray for me and pray with me. Uh, a couple of days later, he texted me. A couple of days later, he called me again. A couple of days later, he texted me. And he did this, I guess, for a couple of months. Until I got news one day that his son had did the same thing. And when, when I heard it, I immediately called him right away. I called him. And I told him, I said, man, I'm so sorry that uh, this happened. I'm sorry you had to go through this. I know you're hurting. And he told me something that will stay, stay with me from, from, from now on. He said, when I was calling you, praying for you, and... Praying with you, he said, I had no idea the depth of your pain. I don't wish nobody have to find out what that's like. Unfortunately, every day somebody else finds out what it's like to lose a child. And we got to do something better. Back to the church. I see the church is being silent. I'm not criticizing, but I'm saying the church is being silent. The church is being silent about Abortion rights. You don't hear the church saying anything about that. The church is being silent about PTSD and suicide. You got to speak up. You, ain't nobody going to do it for us. We got to stand up and start speaking out on these things. 
abortion rights, all these things. We got to, the church has got to be vocal. We got to let the folk know we still here. The church ain't going nowhere. The church is built to last. Jesus said that himself. But you can't sit back and be silent. You got to get out there and raise as much sin about things as other people would. John Stewart, a comedian, actor, got on TV the other day. He said a lot of cuss words. He was cussing the Congress out, senators out, because they didn't vote for money for veterans that had been injured. I think they turned that around and, and, and decided to do the right thing. But it takes people to stand up and let folks know we're not going to take this. The church has got to do that. The church has got to stand up and let folks know that we're not going away and that the power that we have, you can't touch it. You can't stop God. Well, I think uh, when it comes to particular suicide in the church, it's shunned upon as though their soul won't be redeemed. Uh, mental health is shunned upon in the black community because we're supposed to be so strong. But the thing is, people, we didn't commit suicide like this during Jim Crow. We didn't commit suicide like this during the Civil Rights Movement. But now this virus has taken over our community. And as Brother Newsom said, stop. I'm going to ask you preachers, I'm going to ask you religious people, and I'm not going to get into that. But I'm going to ask you religious people to ask before you ridicule Brother Newsom. Boogie committed suicide on February, in February. 2020, right before the, uh, the major announcement of COVID was here. And of course, you know, the last couple of years have been rough. And it started out with that. Not only that, but my, 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 my father-in-law passed away two weeks after Boogie. So that was a double joke to the family. But with Boogie, suicide there's approximately, and I believe more than, 20 veterans that commit suicide every day. Every day. Not skipping a day. That's approximately 20 veterans that commit suicide every day. Something is wrong. Something, the veterans are not getting the help that they need when they come back here. If nobody else is going to speak out, we got to do it. We got to do it. I'm seeing more and more kids walking the streets talking to themselves, howling at the moon. Young people, they went to school with you, went to school with Terrence, went to school with Boogie, went to school with Cece. Their minds are gone. And we just look at them and pass them by. We got to find out what's going on. Well, well Mr. Newsom. Uh, being in the mental health field, I can kind of share a little light on that, uh, especially with my generation. We were the first ones that our parents kind of started testing us with the behavioral drugs, Adderall and Ritalin. And then when we came along and had kids, we didn't want a parent like you guys did. That was too hard. So any time that school would call and say that they had a problem, the first thing we did, we threw them on the medication to get a check. Because of so other many factors, we need the resources and the money. But at the same time, the generation, as a generation of crack babies that were put on Adderall, that end up having babies, through Adderall, all the social drugs, and now you have zombies. That's what they are. Mm -hmm. uh, walking around the city and nobody is asking or trying to address the question, why? And I believe that's the problem with the church. Nobody wants to answer why. They just want to blame and point fingers. When there's no one to blame, it's a situation and it's an energy that's taking over this city. And your prayers and your marches, they are not being heard, Brother Newsom. 
they're not being heard. And I can tell you, uh, fentanyl, I've discovered, is uh, 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 pain for pain. And, and, and I never understood why the drug dealer would want to kill his own customers. But fentanyl has taken over. And I spoke to a lady the other day, and she said she was here from Texas for her niece's balloon release, 16 years old, died from doing drugs, laced with fentanyl. 16 years old, uh, you need to take them serious. They have peer pressure. They are, they are depressed. I know we look at them and say, depressed, you ain't, you know, you ain't start living yet, but you're doing depressed. They are. Forget how they got there. They are. We need to realize that. And because they're trying to find some relief, relief. We go to church, and a lot of times you can find relief there. A lot of times. Uh, you don't go to the club no more. You don't drink no more. You don't smoke no more. But I can go to church and get just as high as I want to get on the spirit. Young folks, young folks don't think that the church is relevant. They, they don't, they, this is the first time in the history of black people that so many blacks don't ascribe to any faith or religion. You'll see them now just wandering the streets. Sunday morning don't mean nothing but another day to them. We were brought up in the church on Sunday morning. Now, albeit some or uh, are more serious and take it more serious than others. But we were brought up in there. And what we have to do is go back to that. The black people, the black community, let me put it this way. Black lives matter. And to say that black lives matter, this is the first civil rights protest organization organized that's not led by a preacher. Hmm. And, and and that's very interesting, uh that that you said that people don't understand that our movement, and I'm not gonna speak on it, but our movement, our diaspora, the movement is being led by people not of you. The the, the agenda that they're pushing is not for you. The agenda they are pushing is the very thing when God said that my people turn away from their wicked ways. It, it, the things that we accept and we take in from the other societies and ethnic groups is not for you. And a lot of our problems are because we bought into it. We, we, we go alone to get alone. And it's politicking in this church house so you can be the big dog or your church can be the big dog. We got to stop it. And if you don't stop it, we don't want God to have to do it because you see the wrath that he's putting on not only America, but I like to focus on Bastrop. Y'all, we got to wake up because because revolution starts in small communities and charity starts at home. I don't care what they're doing in the White House. I don't care what they're doing in Monroe. I care about what they're doing in Mo House Parish. Brother Newsom. Group Magazine. I don't know if you heard of Group Magazine. It's it's what some call our our Ebony. Remember the Ebony magazine? They did a study also, and what they came up with was in the two years, the two year study that they did of one hundred most influential men, black men, not one single one was a preacher. And I, I, I'll speak it on that about influential, influential people. Have you noticed that our celebrities between the ages of 35 and 45 commit suicide now? Absolutely. People, I had brother, uh, I don't know if you listened to the interview, I had brother uh, Bernard Gregory on. He and his sons uh, invented the virtual business app. Mm -hmm. And we were discussing some things about algorithms uh, and these hashtags and these entities that they listen to in these on, on this internet and YouTube and all these different platforms. We don't understand that we're living in a technology age and we're dealing with a group of people that want to be God. 
So a few things have been tampered with because God allowed it. But we have to understand that we have to monitor the things we put in our spirit. I think the word said, search the spirits out and see if they are God or not. So parents, start monitoring what your kids are watching. Start monitoring what they're listening to. Start monitoring who they're hanging out with. Start monitoring their actions because they might be a volcano ready to erupt, Brother Newsom. I'm glad you brought that up because that brings me to another point. Uh, start watching and seeing what they're watching. Uh, let me take you back for a minute. The Andy Griffith Show. You remember Andy, uh, A.B. and Opie and all them, they would, uh, Sunday evening after dinner and everything, Andy get his guitar, go out on the porch, and he'd fire him up a cigarette. They took that out of shows, family shows. Did you notice? They they took that out of family shows. They didn't allow the, the cigarette smoking going on around kids anymore. Okay. They took advertising brands of cigarettes off TV. They took it off. You don't see no cools or camels or none of that being advertised no more. They thought that it was influencing the kids. But you can't turn your TV on today. And I'm not gay bashing or anything else. You know, person choose to be what they want to be. That's up to them. Especially if you're grown. But we're talking about children, for our children. You turn the television on and the children are seeing two men kissing and making out. Two women kissing and making out. They monitor cigarettes and other things, but they fail to monitor that. I'm talking about the FCC and all these other folk. Like I said, the church is silent. Somebody got to speak up and say, hey, hold up, because you're influencing kids. There's more kids now that's confused about their gender. They don't know I, I, I think I'm gay. What's a 10-year-old got business telling you they think they're gay? Because they're confused. We got to do better. Well, we've we, we been talking about that, uh, me and some of uh, my comrades, my associates, about what is carnal knowledge to a juvenile. And, and some of the things, this agenda that they're pushing, um, it's carnal knowledge to a juvenile. Like you said, I can't, I mean, my little girl was watching uh, the uh, network, the children network, and a commercial came on about same sex marriages and this and that, and I was I was stuck. But she said, "Dad, it's okay. One of my friends has two mommies, and I, I was lost in all. Like, what do I do? She's already been exposed to it. So society has taken away a piece of our parenting of introducing things." that we want and don't want to be introduced. How do you feel about that? You know, it's, it's this thing, that this, this big thing right now, it's called rights. And people all over the world are exercising their rights. They got a right to do whatever they want to do. You can marry a typewriter if you want to. You got a right to do it. And what the government has done is open up a can that they cannot close. Because what it does, it just keeps going and going, and it takes another step further, another step further. And eventually, we all going to run off the cliff because there's going to be no turning back. Uh, they're seeing it. Any show you turn on, I, and I know, Lord knows, I, I sit there and I watch, and I think I got me a good show to watch now. And I sit there the first 20, 30 minutes, and all of a sudden, you know, they got foolishness in there. I'm like, that wasn't even necessary. I could have got your point without that. You know what I'm saying? And so uh, this is what our children are seeing, though. And I'm saying that to say this. I'm a grown man, so I, it, I know who I am. Children don't know who they are right now. They're still trying to find their way. And so, like I said, we got to quit being silent, uh, we got to let folks know, look, we're not going to stand for this. Actors and movie stars are selling their souls for a role. I don't know if they actually like that or not, but I think it's just certain roles that I just wouldn't take on television, you know. So, but uh, but but I guess, you know, they figure they got to pay the bills. So, and, and, and the ones that's writing those scripts, 
God help them. I, I guess they may be like that, or they know that's what people want to see. And so they just put it out there, and we reach and grab whatever, whatever you throw at us. And that's, that's been our downfall. We fall for everything and anything. Right, right. It's, it, it's, it's, a, uh, it's an enigma out here in Scrap City, and it's a cloud of darkness over us. And the, and the only way the, shine, the sun is going to shine through is that we stand together and be that beacon light. Brother Newsom, before we get out of here, looking back on it in hindsight, you've seen some of the signs that were there dealing with Boogie. And we miss him. And the military is something serious. And we, we went basketball. We need to do something for our military because he's not the only one that's going through it right now. It's somebody else that's, 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 that's going through it like Boogie was, and we can take care of our own embarrassment. Your final thoughts, if you could go back and talk to Boogie, what would you tell him? Uh, probably what I always told him. I love you. I'm proud of you. I saw him as he was hurt. Uh, I think it was doing football, kind of overlooked, whatever. He was a good athletic kid. You know, but we get, you know, we tell our kids, you know, you got to have a dream. But a dream ain't no good if you don't have opportunity with it. And oftentimes he was overlooked for his opportunities. And I'm, I'm, I'm not complaining. I'm just, I'm trying to answer your question. Boogie was a kind-hearted person that would, uh, he enlist, he volunteered to go to the Army. And what does the Army do? It serves and protects. It gives us, it fights for us to have rights to do what we do. So even though folks mistreat him, he volunteered to go and fight for them to keep on doing what they're doing, whatever it is they want to do. If I could tell him, like I told him then, I said, Book, I, I'm not too sure about you going to the Army. Uh, you know, he's, you know, and then the commercial comes on, you know, you make them strong, we make them Army strong. I say, it's the part where the Army makes you strong that I'm worried about. Because they turn on something that they don't turn off. They just send you back home. And so if I could, I think I would be a little more harder and tell them, no, you ain't, you're ain't, you not going, you know. But I, I try to let my kids make their own minds, you know, even though it was against my better wishes. But he went. He served. He served proudly. Uh, made it up to sergeant. And it just did him, didn't do him good. So suicide is something serious. We know it's serious. A lot of people have attempted suicide and didn't succeed, and they got another chance at life. Uh, but not Book. Uh, not the little young Miller girl. Not uh, Gary Eve's son. Uh, they didn't get that second chance. Uh, nobody was there to talk them off the bridge, so to speak. But I wish someone had spoke up and at least warned us of what he was contemplating. Nobody did that. So if anybody hear me now, if someone has decided that they think that's the last option they have, don't worry about losing their friendship because you're going to lose a friend. Tell their parents, tell someone what their child is thinking. Brother Newsom, uh, we are Emerge 360 uh couldn't come up with a better minister to start this segment off called Community Garden, which we're going to come and pick flowers out of the garden every other week. People, suicide is for real. We send our condolences to all the families of the victims of this virus and this disease that has plagued our community, especially here in Shrop City. Mr. Newsom, we love you. And we wish your family the best. Time heals all. But Boogie left you here to be a testament and be a pioneer so won't nobody else have to suffer and go through the things he did and leave here the way he did in this community. I'm Miles Arata. This has been the Emerge Podcast 360. We want to thank Brochelle Insurance Agency Stepping Stone Counseling of Jonesboro, Louisiana, the 720 Gamers Group. Y'all get involved. Y'all stay encouraged. And most of all, 
y'all stay immersed. And y'all staying like Job. And y'all staying with Mr. Newsom. We out.